Thank you for making it here today for our second forum on addiction. Um, today's topic on women in addiction. Um, we have a lot of important guests and speakers, researchers, treatment providers and practitioners who are here to, um, uh, to give us more information for us to devise a plan moving forward. And it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Senator Ayotte, who's here to speak uh, this morning, as well as Senator Whitehouse. We have Senator Klobuchar and Senator Portman, who will be joining us soon. So again, thank you for coming, and I'll, has, I'll pass it over to Senator Ayotte. Well, thank you, Jessica. I am so glad to be here with all of you this morning. I'm really honored to be here with my colleague, Senator Sheldon Whitehouse, a fellow New Englander, and also a fellow Attorney General, and probably what brings us here as an interest in this very, very important issue. And I also want to welcome, I know you're going to hear from my colleague, Senator Portman from Ohio, and Senator Klobuchar from Minnesota. And all of us here are share the same goal, to get women in crisis the help that they need. And we're very fortunate here to have an outstanding lineup of panelists. I want to thank uh, Director Botticelli for his incredibly important work, all of the experts that you're going to hear from today. And most of all, I want to thank all of you who are working every day uh, to address addiction, to help people who suffer from addiction, and really to lead better quality lives. Because this is an issue, as policymakers, as Sheldon and I were just talking about it, it's not Republican, Democrat, Independent. This is an issue that impacts everyone. And this is an issue that doesn't discriminate. So today, we are going to talk about women and addiction, and the particular issues that women face with addiction, because we know that they're different than men, shockingly, and also the factors that lead women to addiction are different, and how they address addiction and how we may help and treat them are different. So I'm so glad that we're having this important forum today, because as I've already said, addiction doesn't discriminate. It doesn't discriminate from how rich you are, how poor you are, where you're a Republican, you're a Democrat, you're a progressive, you're a conservative. It does not discriminate if you're a man or a woman, but it does impact people differently. And that's why we are having this forum today, to really focus on, on the challenges that women face with addiction so that as policymakers, we can hear from all of you the best way to address this public health epidemic that crosses all boundaries in our country. Uh, I've spent uh, a lot of this year focused on a particular issue that has hit my state very, very hard, and that is prescri prescription drug uh, opioid abuse and heroin abuse. In New Hampshire, we have seen a 60% increase in drug deaths from heroin. And we got our stakeholders together in New Hampshire, uh, whether it was law enforcement, treatment providers, public health officials, first responders, the medical examiner, I got them all in one room, and I was really shocked to hear what is happening in our streets. But I know that New Hampshire is not unique, because I know that this is an epidemic that is happening across the nation. And so today you're going to hear from Senators Portman, Klobuchar, myself, but I want you to know that there are many others in the Senate that are focused on this issue. And I, I'm going to be very proud to work with Senator Whitehouse and the others you'll hear from today to really take your ideas of how we can address uh, not only the heroin addiction, but addiction overall, and make sure that women in our country can lead quality lives, but men as well, because addiction hits everyone. And uh, I've also been working on legislation with Senator Joe Donnelly. And so you have another ally there. And I know that you have many other allies in the Senate. And we intend to engage them on this issue with your feedback and what we hear from you today. In fact, the legislation that uh, Joe Donnelly and I have already introduced is really focused on prescription opioid addiction and the connection between that addiction and heroin. Uh, 
addiction because we've seen that connection. And with the, unfortunately, the cheap price of heroin right now, uh, we've seen also over prescribing and, and sometimes physicians don't even know what they should be doing. So our bill would be looking at developing universally recognized best prescribing practices for pain management, would include well-coordinated education and awareness campaign about the dangers of prescription drug and heroin use, and also would include support for prescription drug monitoring programs and additional uh, resources for not only law enforcement but treatment providers. This is uh, legislation that Joe and I introduced is really what we heard from, from uh, our stakeholders on the ground. And I know right now I'm very proud to be working on a larger effort that all of you are going to help us with today that I know Senator, Senator Whitehouse has been an incredible leader on, Senator Klobuchar, Senator Portman. So we're gonna take the feedback that you give us today and you will be seeing us working on a wider legislative effort to address not only women in addiction, which this is what today's important focus will be on, but also the epidemic of addiction across this country and the public health crisis that we are facing that hits everyone. And you know, I, when I was attorney general of our state, I was really struck uh, by going to our women's prison and meeting many of the women that were in prison. And we know that we can trace many of the criminal uh, activities that women get charged with, with addiction. And we also know that often women who unfortunately have, go and serve time in our prisons, even there they don't get the treatment that they need. They don't get that second chance that they need and the, the treatment as they come back in the community to ensure that they can reestablish a healthy lifestyle so that they don't end up back uh, in that cycle and pattern again. And so this is an issue I've been very interested in even since I've been Attorney General and I hope it's something that you'll talk about today because as I look at women who uh, have been part of our criminal justice system, you can see that addiction is a huge driver for so many women that find themselves in that system. And some of them unfortunately find themselves in that system over and over again. And so we can change that and we can also change uh, this horrible, really public health crisis that makes such a hor an impact on so many people's lives and devastates so many people's lives so that people in this country can live a quality life, that they can reach their full potential, that women can reach their full potential in this country. And this is a big part of it, addressing this uh, addiction, making sure that people are treated with dignity and respect and making sure that we eliminate the stigma. St stigma. We know that many, uh, many people don't come forward, uh, many women don't come forward to seek the help and treatment that they need uh, because they're just afraid. They're afraid that someone is going to say something negative, that someone is going to treat them uh, like, like th that there's something really wrong, wrong with them in, in a way that, that they just don't feel comfortable coming forward. And so one thing as leaders I think that we can do is really encourage people that this is something that hits everyone and to eliminate the stigma. Because I've been really struck by the, the, those who are recovering, who have come forward, their tremendous courage in doing so. And uh, I've met women in my state who have had the courage, incredibly accomplished women who have come forward and admitted that they have had an addiction and been an inspiration to others. So hopefully as policymakers, we can also do more to address the stigma that comes with addiction so that we can get people the help that they need. And with that, I am very honored to introduce uh, my friend and colleague, uh, Senator Sheldon Whitehouse. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, he served as Attorney General for the state of Rhode Island, as I did for New Hampshire. Uh, this is an issue that he focused on when he was Attorney General. He did a tremendous job. And in the United States Senate, he has really taken a leadership role on this issue, not only women in addiction, uh, but addressing the crisis of addiction in this country. And I'm honored to work with him. I'm honored to introduce him today. And with that, I would like to introduce Senator Sheldon Whitehouse. Thank you, Kelly. We have a uh, really outstanding bipartisan nucleus 
of senators working on this issue, Senator Ayotte, Senator Klobuchar just arrived, Senator Portman and myself, and as uh, Kelly said, there are others who uh, are interested as well because this is an issue that does touch so many people. Really, it touches everyone directly or indirectly. So welcome to the second in our series of events that are bringing together public health folks, law enforcement folks, Kelly was an attorney general, I was an attorney general, Amy was uh, her district attorney for the biggest county in Minnesota, and uh, also the advocacy and recovery community to pull together so that we can design the best strategies and policies for uh, moving through the crisis that we see. I am incredibly grateful for the work that you do every day and for your commitment to this issue. Um, as Kelly said, the path of recovery is not an easy one, and it is marked with courage. And those of you who help people along it are really doing a wonderful and humane act. And it's particularly important, I think, that this conference focuses on the problem of uh, addiction for women, which does have different manifestations than it does uh, for men. And it's emerging so rapidly. The Center for Disease Control, uh, the vaunted CDC, reports that the rate of fatal overdoses uh, through prescription painkillers and other drugs among women in America quadrupled, quadrupled between 1999 and 2010, surpassing automobile accidents as the leading cause of death of daughters, sisters, mothers. There are statistics out, it takes a while to gather statistics, so these go back to 2010, but here are some that should get our attention. Suicides stemming from the use of prescription painkillers accounted for 34% of all suicides among women. Among men, 8%. 34% among women, though, more than a third. More than 940,000 women, nearly a million women, were seen in emergency departments in 2010 for drug misuse or abuse issues. More than 6,000 women, roughly 18 every day, died from a prescription painkiller overdose. And that was four times more deaths among women than deaths linked to cocaine and heroin combined. More than 200,000 emergency department visits were for misuse or abuse of these drugs among women, about one every three minutes in our country. So today's forum on best practices uh, for dealing with this issue um, is really, I think, vital. And I really want to thank all of the panelists who are joining us today. Rhode Island is a small state. We all bump into each other a lot. So I need to particularly uh, shout out the two Rhode Islanders who will be presenting as panelists. Uh, Trista Froman has come down from Rhode Island. She began using cocaine at age 13. And she graduated to heroin when she became homeless at age 19. After an encounter with the criminal justice system sent her to the Bronx, she was extradited back to Rhode Island for treatment. Trista credits Rhode Island's Project Link with getting her back on track during her first pregnancy and beyond, and she is here to share her inspiring story. Welcome, Trista, and thank you for your courage. Jody Rich is a professor of medicine and epidemiology at the Warren Alpert Medical School of Brown University, and he's an attending physician at the Miriam Hospital in Providence with expertise in infectious diseases and addiction. He has advocated tirelessly in Rhode Island for public health policy changes to improve the health of people with addiction and to increase drug treatment 
to the, for the incarcerated and for the formerly incarcerated. Uh, in my office this morning, he reminded, that the first, reminded me that the first time we met was when I was running for Attorney General, which was some time ago, and he was harassing me about making sure I got behind the clean syringe policies. So he's been at this a long time. Welcome, Dr. Rich, and thank you. Let me also thank uh, ONDCP Director Michael Botticelli. Uh, Michael has brought a lot of passion and commitment to this issue. He has brought a lot of experience to this issue. And he is joining us now for the second time. He's two for two on these uh, Senate addiction forums. And I really appreciate that he takes the trouble in what is obviously a very busy schedule to come over and participate so energetically in these Senate efforts. I think you see the promise of these, and uh, I'm really uh, grateful. Um, let me also, again, just thank everyone here. These bipartisan gatherings really make a difference. Your input really makes a difference. One of the ways in which it has made a difference is that, uh, based on recommendations from our first forum back in April, and based on feedback from more than 50 different public health advocacy, recovery, and law enforcement organizations, Senator Portman and I are working on comprehensive legislation aimed at addressing the opiate epidemic ravaging our communities. We plan to introduce this bill very soon, and uh, it has enough shape now that I can tell you that it will include programs to help states with improvements of their prescription drug monitoring programs, improve physician and public education, improve prevention and treatment initiatives, improve law enforcement and criminal justice efforts and coordination, and uh, enhance and expand overdose reversal programs. I look forward to uh, working with all of you towards passage of this legislation. And for all the talk you hear about partisanship and disarray, there's actually a quiet pulse of work getting done where issues really do affect a lot of people and have not become political footballs. And I am confident that we can keep this one of those issues. So now, I have the great pleasure of introducing Senator Amy Klobuchar. Uh, we came to the Senate together in the same class. Uh, she is the former pros chief prosecutor of Hennepin County uh, in Minnesota. My mom was from Minnesota and my aunt still lives in Minnesota, and she thinks Amy's doing a really terrific job. She gets a little bit vague if I ask her, am I doing a better job than Amy, or is she doing a better job? I think she's with Amy, actually. Uh, Amy has been a tireless supporter of drug courts as an alternative uh, to incarceration for nonviolent drug offenders, and she's advocated for improved prescription drug disposal programs as a tool to help reduce access to uh, abuse prescription drug abuse, and uh, she's also one of the absolutely best public speakers in the Senate. I mean, she can hold audiences spellbound. She's an extraordinary public speaker. No pressure. <laughs> no pressure. Amy Klobuchar, give her a warm welcome. to do when it's that early in the morning. But I want to thank uh, Sheldon for his incredible leadership. All these people from Rhode Island, I always am giving him, I always give him grief whenever I see something where Rhode Island's in the news where it says, the iceberg that broke off is the size of Rhode Island. I always make sure and send it to him. Um, but of course, there's many great things in your state. I'm sure we have many Minnesotans here. Do you want to raise your hands? Huh? Just pretend. There we are, there we are, yeah. We have so many Minnesotans involved in this issue that we, we don't even know all their names. But uh, we're very excited from our state's perspective that this is becoming so front and center and that we have this kind of bipartisan support. We've always had bipartisan support in it uh, for it from Minnesota. Um, Jim Ramstead, 
uh, who is Patrick Kennedy's uh, mentor, uh, is from our state. I just talked to him yesterday, actually, and uh, he's in great spirits. He's in his 33rd year of sobriety that he celebrates on his birthday, which is coming up. Um, and we really take it to heart in terms of how we run our state's criminal justice system. We have one of the lowest incarceration rates in the country, and we're actually proud of that. Uh, whenever I was running for office, I couldn't debate, you know, in my mind, I'm thinking, I don't think I really want to put this on my brochure as a prosecutor. Um, but in fact, we had one of the lowest incarceration rates. A lot of that was because we used treatment extensively, and we used probation, and carrots and sticks, and other ways of looking at things. And it just makes for a better place. Place. Along with that, we have one of the lowest crime rates in the country, uh, highest voter participation rates, and I think it just makes for a better society uh, when you treat people with some dignity, understanding, and not just blowing it off, understanding that there's going to be consequences uh, if they don't finish that treatment. And one of the first successful drug courts in the country was actually out of Hennepin County. I inherited it when I got into my job, which I did for eight years, ran an office of 400 people, and we continued the work of making sure uh, that we treated uh, those addicts differently and that we um, would make sure that they got the help that they need. And now those drug courts are all over our state, including some of our more conservative counties. Have they seen it as a way to save lives and they see it as a way uh, to uh, reduce spending as well. Um, I'm also interested in this issue. I think some of you know this because I grew up the daughter of an alcoholic. My dad uh, drank the whole time I was growing up. Um, I had many, many holidays waiting for him, looking out the window, hoping he'd show up. Um, and many uh, hard experiences, including where we almost got killed in a car accident when he was driving. I took the keys away from him when I was in high school um, and had those experiences like so many kids of alcoholics do. My miracle story is that after three DWIs, uh, he finally, as the laws stiffened up, uh, when he was actually facing jail time, and he's a very famous columnist, incredible writer, incredible adventurer, mountain climber, uh, but with that hanging over his head, that jail time, he went to a good treatment program, he got through treatment, um, and he, as far as I know, you know, anyone that's dealt with this, you know, but hasn't drank now for decades, is happily married for the third time, and is 87 years old. So you see, these, uh, these stories have good endings often. Um, and so that's why I believe so much uh, in, in treatment. Um, this issue of women in addiction is particularly close to my heart. Um, as someone who for eight years saw what happened when women got addicted, not just, of course, the obvious that they're addicted to drugs, but that they are more likely than to become victims of crime, uh, that they're more likely to get in trouble themselves because of their addiction. I can't tell you how many women we had that would get uh, would try to go gambling and steal and do things like that uh, to feed an addiction. They often did crimes like accounting crimes and things like that in white collar jobs. They would do crimes that would not necessarily be violent, uh, but given the way the laws work, would put them away for a long time. And it would all be about feeding their addiction. Uh, we in Minnesota have a lot of focus on women addicts. Hazleton, uh, you know, we're the land of not just 10,000 lakes, but 10,000 treatment centers. Uh, Hazleton, which just merged with Betty Ford, um, has a special program for women since in 1956 uh, and has been uh, doing a lot in that area. Um, we also, um, in our state, have done a lot with violence against women. I was one of the leaders on the passing the reauthorization bill. And I think that we know that women are 15 times more likely uh, to abuse alcohol and nine times more likely to abuse drugs if they are in a relationship that involves domestic violence. And so uh, that piece of it, I think, is very important. Um, the drug courts, we're continuing as we look at solutions to push for more funding for drug courts as the sentencing bill winds its way um, onto the floor. I think you all know we're looking at reducing drug sentencing, um, which I think is a good idea. I think we'll see some changes um, to the bill as it goes to the floor. Um, and one of the changes I'd like to see is to have more in there on drug courts, uh, because I think if we're going to be reducing these sentences, and as you can see from my story from my state, the longest sentences don't always mean you're going to do something about addiction. But that means we have to also look at the other side of the coin and how we're going to be treating people um, if we're not going to have as long a sentences and how we're going to stop that supply, uh, stop that demand as well as stopping the supply. 
Um, Sheldon raised the issue of prescription drugs, and uh, we all know that has now become this major gateway to heroin, um, as a majority of people who have used um, prescription drugs and become addicted, that people have become addicted to prescription drugs are actually the majority of the people who are now using heroin. And it certainly didn't, um, it wasn't like that years and years ago when you thought of in the 1970s and 60s and people addicted to heroin and junkies on the street corner with needles. Uh, now it's become a lot of people who started with prescription drugs, got addicted to Vicodin, and then move on and decide that they're going to start getting heroin because their supply has been cut off for the prescription drugs. Uh, and that is a long way of saying we need to do more about the prescription take-back programs. They've been incredibly successful. Uh, one at the end of April collected 390 tons of unused drugs in our country. Can you imagine? 390 tons that were just sitting around in people's medicine cabinets. Uh, and that's why Senator Cornyn and I introduced and got past the um, drug take-back bill. We are still working with OMB uh, and with DEA on the rules uh, for that program, uh, it really has to get done because it'll just allow pharmacies and others an easier way of taking back these drugs. It shouldn't just be a once a year or twice a year event at a law enforcement that people don't have on their calendar. It should be an easy way where people know they can bring back take, bring back their drugs so they don't have them sitting away around in their medicine cabinet. Uh, Bill Clinton has recently taken on this issue. I was at Johns Hopkins with Patrick Kennedy and spoke on a panel with him on the addiction to prescription drugs. Uh, and um, I just think that's exciting. I just think there's you are at the cutting edge here in terms of looking at new solutions, uh, not just for women, uh, but overall uh, for the population, that if we can reduce this demand and at the same time um, uh, do something on the supply end by not having things sitting around and by not having over uh, prescriptions, which our bill will work on, uh, that we're going to make a big dent uh, in reducing these addictions and helping women all over the country. So I want to thank you for that and all the great work that you're doing and remind you how important it is. I'll end with this. Um, um, it's about uh, helping people you don't even know. This happened when my daughter was four years old and she was in the church play and she was supposed to be the angel and we were sitting in the pews and she had on this big uh, angel costume with these humongous wings and she's sitting there and uh, she won't go out to practice. And I said, why won't you go out to practice? She goes, because I want to be the donkey. And there were these really hot teenage boys in this donkey costume. And I said, no, no, Timmy and Joey are the, are the donkey. You cannot be the donkey. I want to be Mary. And I go, Mary is 16 years old. You cannot be Mary. And you're only four years old. And you have the best part in the whole thing. You get to go at the end and spread your wings. And I don't know why you don't want to do it. And finally, she looks way to the top of the church, which was this high. And she says, Mom, I don't know how to tell them, but I don't know how to fly. And I said that day to her, I said, you know what, honey, not all angels fly. And by, by, by being here today and by being part of this enormous national effort, you're truly saying that you want to give people the wings to fly, people that you haven't even met, people that never may be able to thank you. But you know that they need someone to help them, and you are being their guardian angels today. So thank you for doing that. Um, with that, I'm going to introduce our. Uh, do you want do you want to introduce Mike? Michael? Okay, good, because I've got a very cool introduction. And I wanted to use Sheldon. Okay, uh, Michael Botticelli, who's the acting director of the Office of National Drug Control Policy. Uh, he was sworn in as uh, the deputy director of the White House office in November 2012, and he served as the director of the Bureau of Substance Abuse Services in the Massachusetts Department of Health. Uh, while working for the Massachusetts Department of Health, he established a treatment system uh, for adolescents, early intervention and treatment programs, jail diversion programs, reentry services for those leaving state and county correctional facilities, and drug overdose prevention programs. In 2008, he was the first recipient of the annual Ramstead Kennedy. See, Minnesota, uh, Massachusetts, uh, Rhode Island, it's like you can't get away from it, uh, National Award for Outstanding Leadership in Promoting Addiction Recovery. He was born in upstate New York. Uh, he holds a Bachelor of Arts degree from Siena College and a Master of Education degree from Lawrence College. Uh, he's also uh, long, in long-term recovery from addiction, celebrating more than 24 years of sobriety. 
I give you Director Botticelli. Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's really an honor to be here, and I really want to thank uh, um, Senator Klobuchar for that really nice introduction, and also uh, Senator Whitehouse. Um, uh, I actually did live in Rhode Island for a number of years, so there's a number of uh, connections here. I'm privileged to do that. And Senator Ayotte and Portman as well. Uh, this is a particularly uh, important forum, and I can I was talking to some people before, and I can't remember a time in recent uh, history where we've really had a forum and a briefing that focused on the unique needs of substance use disorders in women, so I really want to thank them for their leadership. Um, and I also want to echo their thanks to many uh, people uh, in this room, both our federal partners, uh, researchers, practitioners, policymakers, people in recovery. Um, we, we know what we know about addiction and women and addiction from all of the work that you're doing. And uh, I, I've been, I had the fortune to know many of you for many, many years and really want to thank you for your leadership on this issue. And I think it's a really uh, important uh, forum that we uh, have today in terms of how, how we go forward. Uh, I am very honored to uh, represent the Office of National Drug Control Policy. Our office works with federal, state, and local partners to lay out a plan to reduce drug use and its consequences, while also reforming our national drug control policy. Our recently released uh, strategy relies on an approach that balances public health and public safety. It also reflects the current science and state of addiction that is disease of the brain that can be treated for, and from which people can recover. To start with, I'd like to share a few statistics about gender differences in drug use. In 2012, as in prior years, the rate of current illicit drug use among persons aged 12 and older was higher for males than for females. Boys and girls ages 12 to 17 have similar rates of addiction drug use. However, uh, these rates diverge in young adulthood with 25.4% of young men reporting current drug use compared to 17.3% of young women. As you can see from the uh, closest graph to me, women, however, make up a lower percentage of drug treatment admissions, comprising only 33% of overall treatment. This graph also shows the proportion of females admitted to treatment varies by drug. Rates of treatment admissions are higher in women admitted for prescription drugs than for illicit drugs. Also, rates of treatment admissions for men and women are almost even for opioids, amphetamines, and tranquilizers, but with respect to sedative use, women are actually using more than men. This might be one reason, as Senator Whitehouse talked about, why we are seeing uh, increasing rates of overdoses climbing at a greater rate for women than we do for men. Although more men die from drug overdoses, the percentage increase, as Senator Whitehouse talked about, since 1999 is greater among women. Overdose deaths involving prescription pain relievers increased over fourfold between 1999 and 2010 for women. An alarming statistic has to do with drug use and pregnancy in girls. Almost one in five, or 18.3% of pregnant teens aged 15 to 17 reported using an illicit drug in the past month, compared to fewer than one in 20, or 3.4% of pregnant women aged 26 to 44. Our office supports access to appropriate treatment for everyone with a substance use disorder, but because the consequences faced by women can be quite dire, we must acknowledge and respond to the unique experiences to women if we are to make treatment effective and a desirable option. As I travel around the country, I often hear from women in treatment about their desire to be in programs specifically targeted for women. They say they often feel uncomfortable engaging in treatment settings with men, particularly when addressing histories of sexual trauma. Treatment options should also be available to address the unique ne needs of women, allowing them the freedom and comfort to fully participate in therapy. Researchers have shown us success with approaches tailored to women's needs, and you will hear about some of those uh, national experts giving us more information about that. We also know that many women entering treatment have children, but the fear of losing custody of their children can prevent them from seeking care. For mothers to succeed in treatment and to help them to sustain recovery, we must recognize the importance that women place on being parents and how this factors into their decisions they make about their own health and well-being. Women with substance use disorders and dependent children often face significant challenges and involvement with child protective services and the criminal justice system. In many cases, admitting to any drug use is the grounds for removing the children 
uh, from the mother's custody. In some states, drug use during pregnancy may result in child endangerment charges being brought up against the mother. Federal law requires that states have systems in place through Child Protective Services to investigate where there is a suspected danger of neglect or abuse. In some states, the possession of a controlled substance in the presence of a child is a felony. These laws may be a deterrent to a pregnant woman uh, seeking prenatal care. Programs that incorporate supportive services, such as assistance with housing, employment, transportation, and childcare, can help lower the barriers that stand between women and effective care. Further, programs that engage children and family members in therapeutic settings can help women get on the path to recovery that addresses their concerns as caregivers for their children. For women with opioid use disorders, medication-assisted treatment, which combines FDA-approved medicines with psychosocial therapies, generally is an appropriate and useful option. Methadone is the standard of care for treating opioid use disorders in pregnant women, and research has shown great promise in buprenorphine as a, uh, another option as well. While research shows that these medications may result in a newborn experience withdrawal after pregnancy, it is important to keep in mind that these medications can increase the chance that a woman will have a stable pregnancy, enter recovery, and be able to care for her baby. It is also important to keep in mind that such treatment is generally conducted as part of a comprehensive treatment plan that emphasizes prenatal health for both mother and newborn. We must recognize and meet the needs of women providing treatment that is effective, accessible, and affordable regardless of their socioeconomic status or justice involvement. Science and safety should inform our policies and our laws. We need to encourage women to access care uh, using expanded insurance coverage under the Affordable Care Act, and we should also recognize the need to match them into appropriate treatment, incorporating screening and referral to specialty treatment into standardized medical care. Laws that discourage women from seeking treatment should be reviewed and the safety of children considered as we review how to get women into treatment that they need. You will hear from many experts today on effectively treating women with substance use disorders, addressing their trauma, trauma and helping them sustain their recovery. We look forward to discussing how we can address drug use and substance use disorders among women and in ways that we can work together to support them along with their children. Thank you.